Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. Some familiar faces, some new. Welcome to um, the fall event for the CS study group on populism, nationalism, and radical politics, which is being co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center uh, Research Cluster on Global Populism. Um, the CS group is co-organized co by myself, uh, Max Galperud, and uh, Brita van Staldunen. Um, and we're delighted to have a wonderful panel of experts with us today. Um, as you know, we'll be talking about the uh, consequences of, uh, or really on, on about Euroscepticism in the post-Brexit era. Um, and we are very grateful to have um, Matthew Goodwin with us uh, from the University of Kent, uh, Armin Hagverdin from uh, University of Amsterdam, and Kathleen McNamara from Georgetown. Uh, I will not be introducing our speakers. I'll leave that to my co-organizers, but I uh, just want to welcome them and say how grateful we are for your, your presence here. And I look forward to your comments. Hi everybody, I'm Bree tevin uh one of the co-chairs of the study group. And so yes, today um, I'd like to introduce Matthew Goodwin. He's a professor of politics and international relations at the University of Kent. His work focuses on British and European politics with a special focus on radicalism, immigration, and Euroscepticism. He and various co-authors wrote a series of influential books discussing the rise of UKIP and the radical right in the UK. Professor Goodwin has recently turned his attention to Brexit with a series of um, recent academic, ar academic articles as well as a co-authored volume entitled Brexit, Why Britain Voted to Leave the EU. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Ah, okay. <laughs> um, and to his left, we have Armin Hakverdian. Um, he is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. His work covers many diverse topics, including political representation, public opinion, and inequality. He recently wrote a book with Wouter Schakel entitled Net Parliament, which translate as fake parliament. And it's a phrase uh, coined by Kurt Wilders, a far-right uh, politician in the Netherlands. The book examines the mismatch between the interest of the political elite on the one hand and the interests of many different groups in society on the other. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, and then, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> we are just, Yeah, we are here. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. And last but not least, our final speaker needs is Kathy. No introduction. Needs no introduction. But for those of you who don't know, Kathleen McNamara is Professor of Government and Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Her work focuses on the evolution of political authority in the EU and international political economy more generally issues more generally. Her recent work explores populism in the EU and the interaction between economic circumstances and identity in the US. Her most recent book is The Politics of Everyday Europe, Constructing Authority in the European Union, which investigates the gradual cultural transformations that only partially legitimate the EU's power. And with that, we'll hand it over to Professor Goodwin for the first presentation. Thank you. Uh, you guys want me to stop talking after 15 or 20, about that? Oh, yeah, okay. I, um, yeah, okay. So, well, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for coming along to uh, listen to uh, some of my research. Um, the morning after Britain voted for Brexit, I was uh, stood outside the Houses of Parliament, a small, um, small place called College Green. Uh, a journalist from the Financial Times ran over and said... Uh, Britain has voted for Brexit. The currency is crashing uh, in the markets. Uh, and the Prime Minister, David Cameron, has just resigned. It's a strange day. The Prime Minister resigning is only our third most important story. And that, in a way, summarized a sort of shock that uh, ran through much of the uh, commentariat and the public uh, in terms of trying to explain what happened. So I'm going to whiz through some findings. And what I'm, I'm, I'm not going to present a specific piece of research. I'm just going to really bring together quite a lot of things that we've put out since the vote and some other studies and just get across what I, what I think really helps us to, to understand why Britain voted uh, for Brexit. The first point is that actually Brexit should not have been a surprise, that it was a long time coming anchored in a mostly English uh, electorate that never identified with a European identity and that the social divides that led to Brexit were a long time uh, coming. Uh, second, at that referendum, the vote for Brexit was motivated primarily, though not exclusively, by anxiety among several social groups over immigration and its perceived effects on the economy uh, and national culture. And third, those identity concerns, which were especially potent among uh, 
groups that we call the left behind uh, were distinctly unlikely, sorry, are distinctly unlikely to evaporate uh, in the near future and that the potential for populism post-Brexit uh, remains uh, clearly visible. The first point is about identity. I mean, if you guys use the Eurobarometer survey or the European Social Survey, you'll know that the UK has long been one of the least likely uh, uh, states to identify with, with a common European identity or the idea of a, a European demos. This is from the Eurobarometer uh, a year before the vote for Brexit. And the percentage, showing you the percentage of voters who view themselves uh, as, for example, British, not European, so putting their national identity uh, uh, foremost, the UK being the most likely of all European states to do so, but also consistently, you know, since really just before the Blair era being as well, um, uh, you know, really not likely at all to describe themselves as European uh, in terms of their, their identity. This is from the British Social Attitudes survey and shows that at the peak, really, of Britain's love affair with Europe, if there ever was a love affair, only 17% were willing to describe themselves as European. And I, I'm pointing to this really as a foundational element of the vote for um, Brexit, that we weren't really like the Italians or the French or the German the Germans in, in being willing to identify uh, with a European identity. And that was especially true for uh, those who felt English rather than British. Now, if you use the British Social Attitude Survey or the British Election Study, you'll know that when it comes to uh, national identity, people who identified principally as English only or more English than British um, have been consistently more likely to agree that immigration should be reduced a lot, that Britain would lose its identity if more ethnic minorities settled in the country, that there's little or no benefits uh, from EU membership, that equal opportunities for same-sex couples have gone too far, uh, and also would support uh, an English parliament. And Englishness, although diffuse, really runs through the Brexit vote. And it's here where you begin to understand why David Cameron was really the architect of his own demise, having inflamed <coughs> Englishness at the 2015 general election against the Scottish National Party and having willingly uh, mobilised English voters at that election, uh, English identifiers then turned out uh, to a much greater degree for Brexit than those who identified uh, as British. We also have tracked in a book uh, called Revolt on the Right the way in which pretty much since actually the 1970s and 1980s um, those groups in Britain, uh, voters with no uh, degree, uh, haven't gone to university, working class uh, voters have been uh, consistently and significantly more likely to support leaving the European Union, but especially since 2007, that you can see the divergence between those groups uh, all of them actually becoming more Eurosceptic, but working class, less well-educated uh, groups really mobilising uh, around leaving the European Union and the idea of that just before we head into the referendum period. And this is wrapped up in a whole host of social changes that I don't need to uh, go through with, with uh, you today. Um, suffice to say that as um, Britain's economy was transformed, as the <coughs> relative size of the working class declined over time, um, you begin to see also as a new phase of immigration uh, arrives in Britain, you begin to see uh, a mobilization of these groups around anti-EU campaigns. And what's interesting is you also see from 2000 onwards the gradual withdrawal of working class voters from the electoral process. Jeff Evans at Oxford has shown this uh, in a number of papers, but this particular one is by my co-author Oliver Heath, who shows that when you look at turnout by class in Britain between 64 and 2010, working class voters basically uh, began to withdraw from voting during the new Labour era, uh, largely because Labour embraced the so-called liberal consensus on uh, EU membership uh, and uh, immigration, uh, and then actually re-engaged in the political process um, either by voting for the UK Independence Party, uh, UKIP, a populist right party, voting for David Cameron in 2010, who promised to reduce immigration uh, or remaining uh, in apathy. And this was actually an important building block uh, of what happened at the 2016 referendum, 
sorry, I'm going forward. Um, and much of this is wrapped up in a similar way with the US debate. Much of this is wrapped up in the UK's debate at the moment with this, which is the decline in representation for working class groups. This is showing you the decline in the relative uh, uh, proportion of working class MPs in British politics uh, prior to the referendum period. And so when Nigel Farage and UKIP came on the scene, uh, arguing very loudly that nobody was representing workers anymore in British politics, actually the evidence was certainly there to suggest that as new Labour and Tony Blair had moved towards the centre, they'd focused more effort on the, uh, you know, on the middle classes. And so if you just look at things like the Social Mobility Commission in the UK, which tracks uh, the uh, sort of um, levels of university education, the Oxbridge background, uh, private school background, and most of those who enter politics, media, and a variety of different institu uh, institutions in society. Um, you can see, for example, that in politics, around half of those who entered the cabinet of David Cameron had been uh, to, to Oxbridge compared to less than 1%. Uh, in the population, and that also applied across the board with media politics and media media politics and civil service uh, uh, as well as business. The, the broad point, the sketch I'm trying to paint here is is that when you look at survey questions like this one in the BSA, people like me have no say in government between 1986 and 2012. If you look at the far right, you can see how workers basically uh, recorded the highest ever level of political disillusionment shortly prior to that referendum. They just simply felt that the system, about, about half actually overall, coming up to half by the time the referendum was, was, uh, was t uh, conducted, felt that people like them were no longer represented in the political system. And that was intimately wrapped up with concerns over migration uh, and EU membership. Those are just some building blocks behind the Brexit uh, vote. Um, we then see identity and the immigration issue really come to the fore. And part of this is about the salience of immigration, which basically tracks a sharp increase in net migration, which is the red line, and the overall salience of immigration is the blue line. And in essence, immigration dominated Britain's issue agenda for 10 years before the referendum. And this is the fun, this is the key backdrop to that referendum uh, campaign. Uh, and from 2007 in particular, this really gives a very favorable backdrop uh, to the rise of uh, the UK Independence Party, which did something quite significant. We showed this through various papers and articles that UKIP basically merged Euroscepticism with anti-immigration. So the issue of EU membership and in particular free uh, movement, the free movement of EU nationals into Britain, became merged uh, with uh, the, the issue of Euroscepticism. And this was a poster that was used by UKIP in the 2014 uh, European Parliament elections, uh, specifically linking the EU with this idea uh, that Britain had no longer control of its borders. Uh, and uh, this resonated, obviously, among those groups that I've just talked about. So by the time you're getting into that referendum period, almost half of the population are agreeing that the European Union being a member of the European Union is undermining Britain's distinctive identity. Uh, and that really obviously plays well to a referendum campaign that on the Leave side was focusing heavily on immigration, but on the Remain side really took immigration concerns off the table and focused almost exclusively on self-interested, uh, sorry, economic self-interest. So the classic claim by George Osborne that every household in the country would be £4,300 worse off a year if, it vote, if they voted for Brexit, obviously was disconnecting with the chief concern of most voters who were preparing to vote for Brexit, which was uh, principally around immigration and the perceived effects of that on the country. So this is from the book that we've just published with Cambridge, looking at, looking at the, the calculations of whether Brexit was, was a risk uh, and where we're showing that if you'd felt left behind by the transformation of Britain's economy, but in particular if you felt anxious or negative about immigration and its effects on the country, you were significantly less likely to view Brexit as a risk. Uh, in effect, you know, you probably are concluding you don't really have that much to lose by a radical shake-up of the status quo. If you identified with Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, again, you're less likely to view Brexit as a risk. And this is an important backdrop uh, calculation for voters as they're going into the polling stations. Um, this is just a sort of a fairly descriptive representation of more um, sophisticated modelling in the book, showing the way in which concern over migration was by far 
uh, the strongest driver of the vote for Brexit. If you felt that there should be fewer migrants in Britain, you were uh, significantly more likely uh, to want to leave the European Union. And what's interesting is that was the issue that united these quite different tribes of uh, Brexiteers. And there were three distinctive groups that ended up um, voting uh, in a majority for Brexit. And this is an important point because our public debate is trying to reduce the Brexit vote to kind of one type of voter. But this is reflecting the results of latent class analysis by a colleague at the National Centre for Social Research, who makes the point that Brexit was actually an alliance of three groups, uh, affluent middle-class Eurosceptics, about 30% of those had gone to university, but about 70% felt immigration was damaging the country. Older working class voters um, who were typically conservative voters, not always, but only you're very unlikely to have gone to university. And then at the far, far end, economically deprived anti-immigration voters that were overwhelmingly concerned with migration and tended to identify with labor. Those three groups, though they had very distinctive life experiences and backgrounds, shared uh, an, uh, a preoccupation with the issue of immigration and how it was changing uh, the country and had been mobilized uh, by the rise of the UK Independence Party between 2010 and 2016. Just to give you one stat that I think drives home the, the important role of populism in this debate, 70% of Leave voters in the British election study said they, at one time or another they had voted for UKIP uh, or they would have considered uh, voting for UKIP. So the relationship between the Leave vote at the aggregate level and the UKIP vote in the 2014 European election shows you that many of the same areas that in the past had, had pushed on the populist right then went on to vote for Brexit. And this is just a, a correlation, but I think what it's getting at is the way in which the rise of this populist outsider cultivated a lot of the territory uh, and a lot of the areas that then went on to vote for Brexit uh, in large numbers. And this is perhaps some of my favorite bit of research that's come out which asked self-identified leavers in their own words an open-ended question, about 15,000 of them, why they voted uh, to leave the European Union. This is from the British election study, puts it in a word cloud. And you can see there are concerns over sovereignty, country control and, and laws, but when given the opportunity in an open-ended setting, the vast majority obviously went with immigration. And the crucial point that the BES makes, which I think is, un which people still need to reflect on, is that even when voters reference concerns over sovereignty, they often did so in relation to migration. So it wasn't simply about the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. It wasn't simply about institutions in Brussels. Sovereignty was intimately wrapped up in those open-ended answers with concerns over national borders uh, and the perceived ability of the, the nation to control uh, those flows of, uh, those flows of uh, migrant workers. And lastly, these identity concerns, which are especially potent among left behind groups, are also distinctly unlikely to evaporate. Just to tell you where Britain is kind of at the moment, um, there is absolutely no, you know, no consistent evidence of regret or remorse at the moment. Um, in essence, Remainers and Leavers are, are kind of highly polarized behind viewing Brexit as, as the right decision or the wrong decision. Um, and I think you know, we're, we're unlikely to see a significant shift in the future. What we have seen since the Brexit referendum, the vast majority of those UKIP voters in the purple column have basically switched over to the Conservative Party and Theresa May. Um, this was a run up to the 2017 election. And in June, the Conservative Party probably had their best ever post, uh, their best ever election in the post-war period among the working class and non-graduates. Um, so those voters that perhaps in the 90s and early 2000s had voted for Labour, perhaps switch to Cameron or UKIP, really then turn to the Conservative Party in very large numbers. Now, of course, that wasn't enough for the Conservative Party because we really saw the uh, divide over age come to the fore. The generational conflict really came back with pensioners and 55 to 64 year olds really turning to the Conservatives but pretty much anybody under the age of 45 uh, turning towards Jeremy Corbyn uh, and the uh, Labour Party. And age really very much is the new divide in, in British politics. To give you a sense of actually how significant this is at the moment, this is the uh, percentage vote share for Labour, obviously in red, uh, among the under 30s since 1964. And you can see the election in June 
uh, about two in three voting for Labour, um, not necessarily because of Labour's offer on tuition, but simply because of an expressive uh, value-based uh, uh, vote that they feel that that is a way of perhaps protesting against Brexit, but also protesting against the fact that they're going to have a much more difficult time than their parents uh, and their grandparents. So that is very much the new divide. And just lastly, looking at how these two groups of voters uh, are thinking about Britain and where it should should head in the future. And this is just descriptive, but I, I like it because it goes to show the incredibly difficult dilemma that Theresa May and her successors have. For Remainers, and this was, the question was, what do you think should be the priorities for Britain over the next few years? For Remainers, you've got increased spending on the National Health Service, build more affordable homes, raise tax on high earners, increase minimum, the minimum wage, abolish tuition fees. For Leavers, You've got leave the EU, obviously, sharply reduce immigration. The only point of convergence is increasing spending on the NHS, reducing overseas aid, strengthening the armed forces. Now, you might expect this. You might look at this from a US perspective and think, you know, we have a similar, we have a similar debate. But given some of the realignments in the electorate as well, we're actually seeing, you know, on the one hand, non-grads and workers lining up behind the conservatives, graduates, uh, middle class voters, um, more liberal minded voters lining up behind the Labour Party. We begin to see the building blocks of the same polarisation um, that you guys have, have seen, um, have seen in, in the US. But that's hopefully enough to take us into some uh, conversation later on. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me to the uh, to this panel. It's 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 a joy to be here today. Um, so I wanted to zoom out a little bit to the comparative uh, European um, uh, setting when it comes to Euroscepticism. Uh, one thing that has always fascinated me about these European referenda uh, is the alliances that it forces you know, upon very distinct groups in the electorate. So in my home country of the Netherlands, we've had two European referendums. One in 2005, in June, which was on the constitutional treaty, uh, rejected by a large majority of the voters. 60% of the voters rejected the uh, constitutional tweet treaty. 80% of MPs supported it. Um, mind you, this is one of the most proportional electoral systems in the world. Right? where we're not expecting to see such divergence between elites and masses when it comes to ideology or ideological questions. The second referendum that we've had was last year, which was on the association treaty of the EU and Ukraine. You might think that's an odd topic for a referendum, but that was uh, actually initiated by a, um, a signature campaign. So a quirky referendum law in the Netherlands allows citizens to ask for a non-binding referendum on laws that have passed. Um, the same result, 60% rejected the association treaty, whereas 80% uh, of MPs favored it. Uh, among, so it's, 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 it's eerily similar to the previous um, campaign. Um, what I find interesting is that it forced uh, Eurosceptics on the left and the right to campaign in the same camp. And um, this left-wing and right-wing Euroscepticism is, is one of the things that I've tried to research in, in past years. So I'm, I have a comparative politics background, um, mainly focusing on survey data. So that's what I wanted to just briefly talk about today, is whether or not you know, there's a unified bloc against Europe. You know, are these people united against a common foe? Or you know, is, there, uh, is there something else going on? Now, I assume that most people will be familiar with the uh, horseshoe model of uh, European uh, competition. Uh, this is from work by um, uh, Lisbeth Hoge and, and Gary Marx and others. They've used the Chapel Hill Expert Survey, which asks country experts to place parties on, you know, on, on, on dozens of issues related to taxes, EU, and, and, and so forth. 
Um, and one thing you can see here quite clearly is that experts place parties on the left flanks and on the right flanks. They place them on the Eurosceptic side of the scale. Right? So the lower you go, in this case, um, denotes um, uh, opposition. Um, that should be opposition. <laughs> and uh, the center is united in favor of, uh, of more European integration. And the center parties that have mainly driven European integration, of course, are uh, Christian Democratic and Social Democratic party families. Uh, they're the ones who are usually found in the middle of this ideological axis, the horizontal axis, and they are generally more, most in favor of European uh, integration. And they find it for various aspects of EU policy, from fiscal policy to, um, uh, uh, to, to other uh, stuff. Um, all right, yeah, the horseshoe. <laughs> This is if you. Uh, this this is the exact polynomial fit. Uh, <laughs> so you find this. Uh, you know, expert surveys uh, is 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 a controversial means of capturing party positions. You find it looking at roll call data in the European Parliament as well. Um, two um, um, Dutch political scientists um, made this particular uh, graph. On the left hand side, you will find. This is the entire European uh, Parliament, 700 MPs, MEPs, and um, the colors denote the party groups in the European Parliament. Each data point is a individual MEP, and this is for votes on economic issues. Okay? And you can see clearly that there's a, a uh, horseshoe pattern as well. You can see the United Left uh, is um, most against European integration, and you can see some of the uh, radical right parties on the right uh, that are also against European integration. You see the European People's Party, oh wait, I have a, uh, the European People's Party is the black one, the Social Democratic uh, Party is, is on, the, on, on the bottom as well. Um, the nice thing about living in the Netherlands, um, you know, my, my home country, um, is that you know, we have the most proportional electoral system in the world, so we're actually quite blessed, for lack of a better word, with Eurosceptic parties on the left and the right. In fact, we have two Eurosceptic parties on the left, the Socialist Party and an Animal Rights Party, and we have two on the right, the PVV, the Freedom Party, Geert Wilders, and a new one, uh, Forum for Democracy by Thierry Baudet. And in both cases, you can see a clear horseshoe pattern. Now, sometimes this, oh, sorry, uh, sorry about that. Um, Sometimes the um, uh, alliance between left-wing and right-wing Eurosceptics becomes more formal, as you have seen in Greece with the coalition between Tsipras or Syriza and the independent uh, Greeks. So it's a very powerful way of organizing, or at least of, of visualizing, European competition. Uh, the left and the right unified in their opposition against Brussels. Um, I want to dig deeper into that horseshoe. And um, one thing you'll find, I think, if you dig a little bit deeper, is it un unravels pretty quickly. Because the left and the right not only differ in the type of Euroscepticism that they display, but also their motivations for being Euroskeptic are vastly different. So first of all, if we look at that horseshoe among voters, an interesting pattern emerges. This is from co-authors of mine. Um, and as you can see, uh, focus on the, uh, on the bottom right-hand graph, where you see the horseshoe as you would expect. The y-axis in this case is a question of whether or not people thought membership was beneficial to their country. Okay? So it's a, it's a measure of your skepticism. I'll, I'll get into that a bit later. But you can see that that horseshoe pattern is not something that has existed uh, throughout post-war European history. It's something that clearly emerged after the Treaty of Maastricht was signed. Okay. Euroscepticism was always a left-wing um, attitude or position. Communist parties, uh, other left-wing uh, left parties that mainly critiqued neoliberal Europe, for, for lack of a better phrase. Mm. Right. Euroscepticism on the right is a recent phenomenon. And it's been really been mobilized ever since the Treaty of Maastricht was signed. And ever since populist parties were on the rise, they mobilized on cultural issues. Um, and um, uh, you know, as a result, you might think, 
that the left would be more principled in their opposition. I mean, they've been at it for a long time, you know, opposing Europe. And that the right might be ambivalent towards European integration. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. If you look at left-wing Eurosceptic parties, they are tremendously ambivalent about the nature of the European project, or what it entails. Um, Tsipras, this is um, a few days after the uh, Greek referendum on the bailouts, went into the U European Parliament and basically stated what is by now the, 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 common, uh, the common viewpoint among the radical left on Europe, um, namely that it's best to stay within the EU and reform it from within. So he said that the brave choice of, uh, uh, of the Greek people does not stand for a break with Europe, but for a return to the founding principles of European integration, the principles of democracy, solidarity, mutual respect, and, uh, and equality. This isn't hard Euroscepticism, as you would find, for instance, espoused by Geert Wilders. This is a form of Euroscepticism that rejects Europe as it currently functions, but does not reject the principle of European integration. And you see that with many other radical left-wing parties as well, many of them united in the uh, United Left Party Group in the European Parliament. So for instance, um, uh, the, the Socialist Party in the Netherlands, this is their campaign slogan uh, for the 2014 parliamentary elections, the European parliamentary elections. It says no against this EU, and this being the key word. And uh, on the bottom it says, SP, Socialist Party, 100% social. Right? So they wanted more protection, for instance, more, um, uh, more social protection against, uh, or, or a more active Europe on, on the social front. You saw it in their campaign against the Association Treaty. It's, again, no, <laughs> clearly, um, but it says, uh, no, because it's better for Ukraine, it's better for the Netherlands, and it's better for Europe. It's a constructive form of rejection, uh, for lack of a better word. Right? Um, the slogan of the United Left Party Group in the European Parliament is, another Europe is possible. Again, not a rejection of EU membership, but a desire to reform the EU from within. And, um, the uh, only Green MP in the UK, uh, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, I think she's the only Green MP in the UK, uh, but um, she has uh, a same sort of, uh, same sort of uh, you know, viewpoint when it comes to Europe. You know, stay in Europe to change Europe. This is completely different from someone like Geert Wilders and his you know, uh, uh, ideological uh, uh, allies. They categorically reject Europe doesn't matter which aspect of European integration it is, they categorically reject it. So you see this when you look at survey data, sort of cross-national European survey data. The, um, it depends greatly on which measure of Euroscepticism you look at for whether or not you see this pretty little horseshoe figure. If you look at questions on trust in the European Parliament or satisfaction with the functioning of EU democracy, you will find a horseshoe in survey data. You will find that both the left flank and the right flank are more <coughs> distrustful. And you will find most trust in the EU and satisfaction with, with the functioning of the EU in the center. However, when you look at a more policy-based measure of Euroscepticism, for instance, when it comes to strengthening of Europe, more integration or um, uh, something like opposition to enlargement, you'll find that the left um, uh, is, um, in fact, um, more in favor of strengthening than the center. And you will find that Euroscepticism is mainly an attitude that is found on the extreme right. So the horseshoe doesn't apply to policy-based measures of Euroscepticism. A lot of voters to the left of the Social Democrats are in favor of particular forms of EU strengthening. So the nature of Euroscepticism is completely different among those sort of the groups that appear to be allies when it comes to a binary referendum choice. When you dig a little bit deeper, their object of skepticism differs greatly. And second, it, um, the origins of their Euroscepticism differ as well. So 
On the right, unequivocally, it's identity issues, driving both forms of Euroscepticism. Um, and you can, you can operationalize in different ways, as Matt has shown, whether it's a European identity versus a national identity or simple questions on immigration. Um, these are the predictors and strong predictors of you know, both a rejection of the principle of European integration as sort of the uh, state of the current EU. So both forms of right-wing Euroscepticism are anchored by cultural attitudes. The left, again, is much more ambivalent. You'll find that economic issues matter to people on the left. Right? So issues about redistribution, for instance, are a predictor for Euroscepticism on the left. Um, but among left-wing voters, you will also find that identity issues are important. The left is extremely ambivalent, and this is reflected also by the demographics of left-wing European parties. On the right, you will find the common sort of creasy type explanation for uh, the left behinds. You will find that education stratifies this uh, support for right-wing Eurosceptic parties. <coughs> On the left, uh, there is no, there is no uh, clear picture that emerges. Uh, in some countries, the higher educated are more likely to, to, uh, to embrace left-wing Eurosceptic parties. In others, it's lower educated. It's very context-specific mm. what these education groups do as regard to voting for left-wing Eurosceptic parties. There's no ambivalence whatsoever on the right. It's heavily stratified by education. So um, I think this raises important policy implications. In Brussels, they love one-size-fits-all solutions to Euroscepticism. And prime among these is economic growth. So a lot of people in and around Europe, uh, Brussels seem to believe that once your you know, economic growth picks up, Euroscepticism will you know, decline. Um, Economic uh, motivations are, you know, at best, only going to reduce Euroscepticism among some left-wing groups. Uh, the right is going to be impervious to any form of economic, uh, economic improvement. It's not because of the economics that they voted for these parties. And a second thing that fascinates me is, you know, obviously the cultural dimension in politics has been mobilized in Europe and in other places in the world. In Europe, at least in the past 20, 25 years. And it's mainly centrist, you know, center democratic parties, uh, Christian democratic parties, sorry, and, uh, and liberal parties on the right that have embraced immigration as an important issue and have activated cultural identity among, among certain parts of the electorate to compete with the radical right. right. And maybe for short term domestic purposes, this is a fruitful strategy. However, by activating the cultural identity of these people, they're also turning them against Europe. Um, and I think that this is a particular form of uh, you know, a trade-off that uh, a lot of uh, the Christian Democratic parties have been making, um, activating the cultural identity of people while at the same time uh, ensuring that they embrace Europe or free trade agreements is impossible. So the domestic and the international uh, strategies in this case seem to be at odds with each other. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you for your... Uh, thank you. I don't know if you want to sit there. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, sorry, how do I... Oh, there they are. Magically, they appear. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, so I am going to kind of step back a little bit from these really useful, more sort of um, uh, specific analyses of the data around, around Brexit and Euroscepticism and kind of frame the broader questions in terms of um, some of the recent work that I have done that I think may, may help us understand a little bit um, the trajectory of the EU and, and particularly um, how we might think a little bit about what happened with Brexit. And so the title is When the Banal Becomes Political, You're a Skepticism in a Post-Brexit Era. Or not. Okay. So um, what I really want to highlight is that we should not forget 
that your skepticism may not actually be as surprising as uh, some people think it is. And I think that uh, the, my colleagues have sort of pointed this out. That if we think about the EU, it really is an extraordinary example of what we could call post-national governance. It's something really without um, a sort of counterpart in the world. It's something that actually has intruded into the everyday lives of Europeans in ways that are quite surprising and sort of spectacular when you think about the primacy of the nation state, right? But that this process of European integration has by and large historically been built on what people call a permissive consensus, right? That it actually has gone forward up until Maastricht as, as was discussed in a way where there really wasn't a lot of overt contestation and sort of political discussion about the path of European integration. Um, I would argue that it was really marked by sort of technocracy rather than uh, overt partisanship. So my earlier work was about the Euro. And one of the things that I was so shocked by when I started out as a graduate student in Brussels uh, as Maastricht was happening, was how little discussion or variation there was left and right in terms of political parties across the EU about this extraordinary development of a single currency, right? So of course, that's all gone, right? You can't design away politics. You can't sort of imagine that the European Union can somehow grow and change and evolve in these ways that are incredibly intrusive in terms of very important political values, distributional effects, and so on. And so, of course, we have uh, the, uh, this all coming to a head right in the last uh, five or so years um, with the Eurozone crisis, with the immigration crisis, and with Brexit. So, you know, the EU is boring no more and has actually sort of opened itself to all kinds of interesting um, studies for political scientists once again. Um, and I would argue that this was actually very inevitable. If you think about the kind of history of nation building and state building and political development more generally, the fact that the EU has taken on all these different roles in regulating people's uh, lives, um, that Euroscepticism can really be understood as, in many ways, a very natural response. So I tend to think about this in terms of the notion of the EU as an example of what we could call incomplete political development, right? That if we think about the history of comparative political development and the, particularly the rise of the nation state in the 19th century, you really see that um, in the case of the European Union, power has accrued to this center of the EU in ways that look very much like these earlier cases of state building, but it's done so in very uneven ways, right? And so, you know, you think about the Euro, the development of a monetary union and a single currency that occurs absent a fiscal union or broader political union. And, um, you know, I've done a bunch of historical work on this and there, there is literally no other example of a currency union with a single currency that lasts, that is successful, absent that broader political union, right? That historically currencies have come about as part of these bigger state building projects. Um, Schengen is another great example of this, right? Just, you know, taking down the internal borders in ways that are very consequential politically has been discussed by my colleagues. Um, but it's done in a way where there's no serious effort at hardening the external boundaries of the EU, right? There's no, you know, Frontex is, you know, very underfunded and, and doesn't actually have sort of sovereign control over external borders. Um, and if you kind of think about the EU's development in this historical sense, it begins to sort of uh, make sense and, and be clear, right? That the EU is this very unique historical form that has developed you know, through summits and institutions and laws, right? It has not developed as most nation states have through the cauldron of fighting war, right? The EU does develop, of course, in part based on an effort to move away from uh, the horrors of World War I and World War II, but there's no sort of prosecution of an active war in the way that there are in basically many, many other historical examples, right? If you look at currencies, they often come about in the context of war fighting, for example. 
So this uneven political development can also be extended to this notion of the EU as a very fragile, imagined community. Right? We know that uh, people like Benedict Anderson and others have pointed to the role of nationalism and the rise of the imagined communities um, as a very important sort of supporting uh, cultural foundation for the development of the accrual of power at the center of these new polities. And so the question is, if we needed that for the nation state, does the EU need such an imagined community and such a distinct sense of attachment to a European identity? Um, and how has that proceeded? So I argue in, in my recent book, The Politics of Everyday Europe, that in fact the EU does have an imagined community, that there have been sort of very specific uh, efforts in terms of the symbols and practices of EU governance that have created a sense of Europe and a sense of a sort of bounded, new bounded political community, but that it, these uh, practices and symbols have gone about in a way that are very, very different from these earlier cases of nation building. That they've actually been very consciously banal by design. That in fact the European uh, elites, both national and, and EU level, have designed these symbols and practices in a way that sort of de-racinate de, uh, or sort of make banal, make very technocratic, things that are in fact quite consequential and should be very politicized. And that the EU has also sought ways to sort of um, uh, make that, uh, make those deeper uh, political developments seem less threatening by navigating national identities, navigating the nation state, and localizing, and seeming to sort of make complementary these European level governance systems and identities with the national identities. So these are just some examples. For example, the euro, of course, has nas national symbols on one side and uh, European symbols on the other. Um, the high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, right, this new uh, very consequential role for uh, a foreign policy actor at the level of the EU. Every time I teach this in my class, I have to go and look at the name because, of course, it's not the European Foreign Secretary. That's not the name of this actor, right? So it's very consciously framed in a way that does not directly confront the amount of, of uh, change and transformation that is actually occurring in these situations. So you have, you know, for example, at the borders, you have, you know, borderless, uh, uh, no, no, no more sort of uh, customs crossings and so on and passport controls. And you have, you know, the, the German uh, name of Germany and then surrounded by the EU, the EU symbol. So there's always this effort to sort of contextualize and make seem less overtly threatening what's going on. Um, so one example for uh, is you know the European passport, and I realized when I was putting together this slide, this should have given us a clue of what was going to happen, right? Because of course this is the German passport where you have European Union and the German symbol, and of course the U UK passport where the U you know UK symbol is extremely large on the passport, right? Um, but you have you know things like Erasmus and so on, which try to inculcate this sense of Europeanness and and Europeness but in a way that doesn't directly confront the important national identity of the nation state. Does it, well, this is CES, so you guys all know what the EEAS is. Who knows? Come on. Anyone? Bart knows. What is, does anybody know what the EEAS is? European External Action Service. Service, the European External Action Service. So this is the European Diplomatic Corps. But it's not called the European Diplomatic Corps, is it now, right? So this is the European Foreign Service, which is a dedicated group that starts after the Lisbon Treaty as the EU moves into this more important role as a foreign, foreign policy actor. So what um, does the EU need to do then to get out of this sort of banal by design um, uh, sense of avoiding what's really going on? What would really actually create the foundations that would make the EU more likely to survive all of its different crises. Well, obviously, the EU needs to actually fix its various policy problems, its institutional problems, uh, the Eurozone crisis, you know, Schengen, et cetera, et cetera, and to create social and economic opportunity for all. But it also needs to, I think, work very hard on the question of real channels of representation, accountability, and contestation. Um, that I would argue that we know from historical examples that the path of political development is never smooth and never easy. And therefore, we should uh, 
work to think about how to make the EU and its contested policies more real to people in their everyday lives. Um, so I would argue that instead of hiding from what the EU is doing, there needs to be more explicit engagement with the distributional issues and more healthy politicization around the EU. Um, and that we need to sort of think, or those who believe in the project of the EU, and I would say I am one of them, need to think about how to address identity politics head on and deal explicitly with questions around things like immigration and difference. And I would say that Macron, of course, is very interesting. This is a gentleman who, you know, on his election night, goes to the podium with Ode to Joy, the uh, unofficial EU anthem, playing in the background and who uh, you know, tries to, I think, more overtly address these questions of how to deal with the politicization of the EU in a more constructive manner. So I will finish on that, uh, on that slide and look forward to our conversation. Who wants to start? <laughs> Please, Peter. Uh, Peter Hall, I'm in the, the fact that I'm member of the government department. Um, since I wasn't planning to ask the first question, and no one to do this because no one else is, I, I formulated it. But I guess that um, I, I, the, the nature of the question is to ask uh, in these analyses, um, how far do any of you want to draw a separation between? the economic, if you like, and the cultural, if you like. Uh, I mean, that, in terms of support for populism, uh, that comes down to a question about whether, for instance, um, uh, these uh, issues of identity that are linked to uh, immigration and anti-immigration sentiments, for instance, uh, should be analyzed uh, separately from the is economic discontents that might give rise to them. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, how we might think about the relationship. I wonder whether you think uh, uh, that's maybe not the right question, that, that in fact drawing these dis the, a sharp distinction between the two makes more sense for understanding these phenomena. Uh, but if you, if, if you don't think that, uh, can, can any of you say a little more about uh, how the economic uh, economic circumstances of individuals, whether in distressed regions or whether in uh, low-income households or the like, uh, uh, might feed into uh, these cultural worldviews uh, mm. that are associated with your skepticism uh, on mm. the right, certainly, and, and arguably on the left. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Few, Can few I, thoughts. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. This is the million dollar question, right? And I think the way that we set, it, set up the literature at the moment and the debate between economics or culture is unhelpful. Um, I mean, if you were to just take a look at the literature on just the Brexit vote and you just run an analysis of what predicts whether or not somebody voted to leave the European Union, you know, income just doesn't come anywhere near uh, the effects that, say, values would have, right? That uh, or Or public opposition to, to immigration as a product of, of those deeper values. And so this has kind of pushed on that cultural backlash argument. But we also know that, you know, if you just take, take Britain as an example, we know from the literature on inequality that part of the reason that large numbers of working class voters stopped voting after the election of Tony Blair in 1997 was because the economic settlement wasn't really working out for them, as well as later on they didn't really agree with Blair's position on migration and EU membership. And we know that people who felt subjectively left behind were more likely to then play down the risks of Brexit. And as, as they went into the polling station, they may have said immigration was the key reason, but a backroom, an important backroom calculation for those voters was also that you know the system isn't currently working out for me and my group, and I think there's an interesting there's interesting work now on the role of relative deprivation or nostalgic deprivation, sense of social as well as economic loss for one's group, that has clearly influenced the backroom uh, assessments of costs and benefits as they relate to EU membership. I don't think I don't I think this debate and we have it every day in the British media at the moment, is it economics, is it culture? I don't think it's very helpful. Now, if you look at the literature on radical right voting, I'm sure Armin will make this point maybe, um, but you know, if you just run 
the, the, the analysis of why people vote for parties like UKIP, then, then immigration attitudes and you know, authoritarianism, you know, re they really have strong effects. But these are also voters that are coming from particular life experiences, not all of them, but, but a large number of them that have gone through often quite dramatic uh, economic experiences, the collapse of you know, unions, for example, in northern England, the collapse of traditional industry, deindustrialization. If you just map the Brexit vote, you'll quickly find that the strongest areas for leave were coastal areas in England that have suffered from a chronic lack of investment over 40 years. Now, the models would say, if you look at those voters, that it's all immigration. I, you cannot separate uh, that life experience um, from the decisions that they took in June 2016. There's a lot more work that needs to be done uh, in that area. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? I agree with Matt that this is uh, this is the multi-dollar question or multi-million dollar question even. Um, in um, I think in any any uh, country that goes through it's the forty billion euro question. There we go. So, yeah. Uh, either way, I can't afford it. So um, <laughs> the. Uh, I think any country that, that experiences an election where a right-wing populist uh, a party has suddenly gained votes or something like Brexit occurs or a referendum such as France and, uh, and the Netherlands uh, experienced in 2005 where you know, suddenly large sections of the electorate reject something like the European uh, Constitutional Treaty, inevitably the discussion comes down to is this about identity or about economics. I think that this is the perennial question that, um, you know, that the, even the academic discourse, public discourse. Um, one thing that I've uh, noticed mainly since I um, follow election results on social media is that right after elections, you usually see maps, electoral maps. And a lot of the times it's the aggregate level analyses that support the economic argument. It's an, it, it's an argument about regions undergoing a particular transformation or, uh, yeah, as Matt said, the, uh, the, the, the coastal regions or uh, the same in the US case, the same in the, the Austrian election or the Dutch election. You always have, this, uh, you have these maps where, where then it turns out that, that in counties or in states or whatever, that uh, that suffered most economically, you know, either you know, percentage of Trump voters is high or Brexit Brexiteers, or um, and then and then when the individual level survey data comes in, mm. you get the you get the cultural bandwagon going, where it turns out that variables like income or um, attitudes on redistribution or you know that they don't correlate at all or very marginally with you know, uh, uh, support for, for, for populism or support for Brexit or, or whatever. And um, th I think that th this is more than just a methodological sort of matter of ecological uh, correlations versus individual level correlations. It might be an interaction. It's in, it's in deprived areas where these national identity concerns come into play, uh, where people look for maybe a um, scapegoat or um, you know, s something along those lines. But at the individual level, the survey data simply does not point to income or, or, or you know, it, it's education. Education trumps all of the, uh, all of the other uh, uh, socioeconomic or demographic features. Um, and education anchors cultural attitudes. It hardly, it hardly uh, anchors uh, economic attitudes. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to, to take the individual level survey data first because that's what tells us what happens within aggregates. Um, I, but I don't, I don't have any sort of conclusive evidence on, on either two. It's so Peter and I have talked a lot about this in the last year or so. Um, so he's heard, heard my thoughts on these, these things, but um, I'll sort of throw out some things. And maybe I'll just sort of come straight off of, of your comments. I mean, I actually think it's a mistake to just look at the individual level stuff. I think we need to cast our net very wide, and I like very much 
uh, Matthew's point about uh, the different tribes of, of Brexit voters. And I think we need for all of our kind of discussions about these incredibly important and consequential political upheavals that we are that we are living through that we we really um, reject the notion of some sort of monocausal story about what's happening. I think that's sort of number one. And that's always difficult because we're sort of, you know, trained to think that way and we get sort of uh, probably rewarded by our profession. Certainly in political science, you get rewarded by that, right, for doing that. But I think we have to um, be more creative and kind of think beyond that. And the reason why I think we wouldn't just look at, and I know you didn't say this, but, you know, think beyond the individual level is, you know, I'm, um, I think that there are very interesting stories to be told about um, this question of the, the different geographies of these uh, economic experiences and how that translates, as some of you know who, who have seen my recent work, I'm very, very interested in how sort of different geographies of economic experience might create different sort of cultures and lived experiences that shape the way people make sense of politics and, and think through politics um, in a similar way to the kind of work that Kathy Kramer did on Wisconsin. I think we really need to sort of pay attention to the ways in which people coming together and experiencing things and talking about those things and making meanings of those things translates into outcomes. And so that very much rejects the notion that we would divorce material realities somehow from identity. Um, I've hung around sociologists for so long, I think identity is always and everywhere with us, and that clearly, even in markets, people have very important identities that are shaped uh, uh, by their experiences. Um, so, you, you know, you, you know this, Peter, I'm, I think the, the project of, uh, certainly in my discipline, political science, is for us to try to sort these things out. And there, there is, I think, some, some really good work sort of coming out of our troubled times. I mean, I think Ken Shivy's paper, which I think he presented in this research cluster, is presenting soon on uh, authoritarianism that he, that he co-authored, you know, really does try to sort of start to build a model where we can think carefully about how economic circumstance and culture and identity play together in different circumstances. Why does, it, why does one type of identity get activated? And we shouldn't forget, of course, the role of motivated political elites, right, in fanning the flames of certain types of identities over others. That's clearly been incredibly important in the, in the last few years. So I think we have sort of a big project ahead of us in trying to sort through, and your own work is, is helping lead the way, I think, as well in this. So that's what I would uh, sort of say to the graduate students here, you know, embrace that complexity, try to make your way through it, build better models of how these material and these, these more cultural things interact. That's a heavy, heavy to-do list for you. I mean, one, one, one additional thing I'd like to, um, uh, the, uh, it's very interesting once you look, when, so I'm, I'm, uh, my research is mainly focused on Western Europe and, and, and Northern Europe. Um, when you look at the differences in Euroscepticism, also in the demographic predictors of Euroscepticism, right. there's a right. huge difference between the North and the South. Right. Right. And exit skepticism, for instance, yeah. the idea for an exit or a Brexit or a Frexit or whatever, yeah. uh, whatever right. type of uh, exit you want. Um, hard Euroscepticism is very popular in those countries that They're have weathered the storm yeah, quite well. Right, right. And Catherine DeVries, and, who's not here, has really great data on that. Yeah. And, and, and um, uh, so it seems like people in the countries that have weathered the storm yeah. are... A downplaying the importance of the EU, whereas those in the uh, in the Mediterranean countries uh, feel as if they need the EU to and they do. to survive. <laughs> um, but that, that, yeah, that's also yeah. not to cut you off. Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, so so I think uh, <laughs> okay. so to add we'll layers just debate. of debate. You don't get that. It's, it's, it's you know it's 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 probably the same debate as as you know you you, you would have in the US. So what to do to win back. Uh, or, or what the Democrats ought to do in order to win elections again. I mean, there are so many geographic, uh, uh, you know, contin contingencies that go on, and it's the same in in uh, in Europe as well. So, as I the the one size fits all Brussels solution, yeah. sort of economic yeah. growth, yeah. it'll embolden hard Euro skeptics in the north. You know, they're not going to attribute growth to Brussels; they're going to attribute it to their national governments. Um, so, um, yeah, more layers of complexity. Uh, between yeah, between the geographic region and these two uh, factors, I, think. I was only going to add that. Um, I mean, if you just look at the life cycle of populism in Europe, you know, it's an easy rebuttal to 
a lot of my economist friends who focus excessively on the effects of the Great Recession. Mm. Um, mm. You know, and there's, there are two studies now showing that the populist right, which is almost always Eurosceptic, um, has done better in regions that were the least uh, affected by the financial crisis, mm. scored most of its gains prior to the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the onset of the mm. crisis. And, mm. you know, that takes us into this discussion about relative and nostalgic deprivation, which I keep coming back to because it's an old idea, but it's an idea that I think for good, for yeah. good reasons is coming back into yeah. fashion and relates not only to feeling subjective Definitely. perceptions of material loss, but also yeah. social loss and yeah. cultural loss. And if you just look at the British election study has a nice measure of um, it asks voters in Britain, you know, are you finding, are you, are you struggling to get by uh, in life? Uh, or are you, are you getting ahead? And I mean, the support for Brexit among the former yeah, is just of off the charts, right? right? right. And now totally that is channeling other things, mm -hmm. you could argue, but you could also argue that actually people's perceptions of how they are uh, getting along in society relative to others would take us into that discussion about it doesn't really matter about the broader economic climate in an objective sense. It's Definitely. a subjective sense of how you're how you're doing relative to others, whether those others are migrants or whether they're, you know, the kind of white underclass or your more affluent employer. And I think that uh, Justin Guest's work is good on this. About to say, yeah, yeah, looking yeah, at fantastic. support yeah. for populism embarking in, in outer East London, which voted very heavily for Brexit and Youngstown, yeah, Ohio. Youngstown, right. And fantastic. I'd like to see that rolled out and, yeah. and tested in. We're actually going to replicate his questions in a survey for Remainers and Leavers, right. just looking at that. And I think that there's a lot more work on that to be done. Uh, my question is primarily directed to Kate. I, I like very much your idea of uh, the European Union as an example of incomplete political development and uh, your comments on the way in which uh, deliberately banal design has encouraged that. But you then uh, pointed to Macron's mm -hmm. inaugural speech as a moment where a politician began to face the real uh, identity differences that uh, underlie this. However, if you look at uh, Macron's subsequent speech, his manifesto on Europe at the Sorbonne, he begins by saying, the reason Europe needs to be defended is because we Europeans share common values and interests. Hmm. Now, what can be more banal than that? Yeah. Uh, having let off with that, however, he then yeah. goes on yeah. to list any number of conflicts of value and interest, uh, starting with the differences between East and West over immigration and continuing with uh, uh, posted workers and underlying economic differences and so on. But it seems very hard uh, for a leader to make a major speech on the European Union without uh, avoiding, yeah. at least in the opening paragraphs, uh, th this banal conception of Europe as something that unites us all. Right. So, so yeah. how, how do you realize <laughs> the devitalization? Right, uh, right. That's my question. So this is when I'm so happy that Unity I'm in an ivory in tower. What? <laughs> what? Unity and banality. Yeah, well, that's what they were trying for. And it worked for a long, long time until it didn't. So, but I mean, this is when I'm so glad I'm in an ivory tower, right? I mean, where, you know, clearly I can sort of point to the problems, but, but solving them is a whole other thing. And I think that it, it, this isn't going to answer your question, of course, but I think that, um, you know, it really speaks to the broader um, difficulties of thinking about cosmopolitan identities, right? And how do they actually get their tenter hooks into people in a way that creates um, a true commitment to some sort of political community, right? I mean, that is, I think that is the big, big challenge of the 21st century and the era we're in, right? How to, how to actually flesh that out in a way that makes people think that they can sacrifice for each other, right? When it's not in a sort of exclusionary identity, but it's built to be inclusionary. Um, and you are the Macron expert, so I shouldn't have even mentioned his name you, with you in the room. But I thought that like the De Zeit interview, interview was interesting, right? Where he talks about we need a heroic narrative of, right? Der oh, Der Spiegel, sorry. We'll see yet again. I should just <laughs> shut up, basically. Um, but I mean, and I'm curious what you think, because you have you know, followed him much more closely than I have, but he sort of talks, I think, about, does he use the word heroic? I think we need a heroic narrative, right? Which speaks to this, you know, 
nationalism was about heroes, right? That those are the people you put on your currencies. You put specific individuals and heroes. I mean, do you sort of reading the tea leaves? Do you do you see at least some you know some potential for him to sort of think about seizing this moment? Uh, well, so I'll throw it back to, uh, to uh, Arthur. As it happens, I just finished writing an article this morning which ah. I take up this issue. Ah. And, uh, <laughs> what, I, what I conclude with is that Macron's uh, style of governance is a very theatrical yeah. one. And the theatrics are designed to uh, conceal the fact that underneath mm. it is a centrist politician yeah. <laughs> who uh, really is wedded to penalty. Yeah. 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 But yeah. he recognizes yeah. that penalty doesn't motivate yeah. anyone. Yeah. Uh, so he's trying to compensate for what right. he sees as a deficiency right. in centrism. Right. Right. That's the right. best I can right. do. No, no, that that actually rings true to me. Yeah. I, mean, I think you, also. Yeah, do you French, have an answer? I hope. French, no, I need to add that <laughs> yeah. French voters clearly were aware of that during the actual yeah. campaign when I think it was only 11% said. Emmanuel Macron uh, understands the uh, the needs of the nation, right? That uh, even even when you look at the metrics, when he was against Le Pen in the second round, I mean, she was still um, among particularly workers, was still seen as understanding the concerns, uh, understanding the problems in the nation um, uh, to to a greater degree. But but I think you know just to try to push back a little bit on that. I mean, I'm interested in your views on the interaction of this, you know, this idea that you can build a community at the European Union level, how that interacts with national identities. I mean, if you'd taken, you know, all the kind of Linda Colley, Robert Toombs stuff on Britishness, Englishness, yeah. Michael Kenny's work, you would basically have concluded that Brexit was always a firm favourite, that right. the way that Englishness evolved as being, you know, exclusive, constantly defining itself against you know, the other, whether it's Normans or, you know, the Germans yeah. and whoever yeah. else. Yeah. And that, you know, if you'd looked at those Merino scales going back in time, you know, you would always have realised that the English were just waiting for that moment to mobilise against what they saw as a community that, that was too transnational, yeah. that didn't really Absolutely. stand for anything. Absolutely. So how can the EU possibly navigate that when you take into account the national traditions in Central and Eastern Europe, sure. which are even more sort of ingrained, I would suggest, against the idea of an inclusive, right. cosmopolitan, pan-European identity? Right. So I would say um, absent um, a sort of very motivated and possibly coercive um, political elite who decides that they are going to create, say, a French national identity or a German national identity or an Italian national identity, right? So if you look historically, you know, people, uh, even the United States, right, Tocqueville comes and he writes about the different nations of, the, of these United States, right? It was not at all a clear thing that we would have, and I have an expert on this in the room, so again, I should probably just be quiet. But, you know, what I'm so struck by by reading history is that these transformations have occurred in situations where no one would have imagined, you know, 100 years prior that you would kind of move to this new political unit with a coherent political identity. But it has always occurred in a much more coercive way where uh, political elites stomp out the previous power holders, right? And that clearly is not the path of the EU and arguably in the 21st century of liberal democracy, not the way things are going to go forward. So I'm, I'm not, quote unquote, optimistic about this path. Um, but I would say never say never, right? That you do see, I think, if you read the history, you know, remarkable transformations. I will also say that I did call Brexit in when when uh, Cameron gave the Bloomberg speech. I wrote a piece in the Post which said the EU has penetrated so deeply into everyday lives. We shouldn't be surprised that there's a backlash and, of course, referenda. You know, poor man's democracy where you can't really control anything. So we'll we'll we may see. Brexit by the end of the decade. And Andrew Mravchuk got really mad at me. <laughs> but I think he owes me like a, a case of champagne or something. If it happens, I don't know if it's going to happen. Go ahead. You can yourself as well. Yeah, well, my name is Claymore. I'm actually just visiting, but I finished up my doctoral work in philosophy. So I'm looking for the next thing to do. Um, and, Populism. <laughs> um, and so, of course, I'm coming to political science. Um, and uh, as a philosopher, I feel like I'm, I tend to be drawn to extreme cases. And so thinking about the, you know, the rise of, of populism and nationalism in different parts of the world, in the US, I'm looking at Texas. 
that happens to be where I live. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I think, a really interesting, strange kind of place. Mm -hmm. And I bring that up because um, I, I share your sentiments about wanting to have <coughs> multi-causal explanations for these mm -hmm. things, for these phenomena that we see. Um, and so I'm wondering if, in addition to this two-legged stool that we've been critiquing of identity or culture, not really sure if those are exactly the same right. thing, and uh, economic situations, we could add something like structural political features mm -hmm. or political yeah. institutions yeah. and have Absolutely. a you know three-legged stool, noticing that you know not all of the factors that we could name are going to be as significant as all the others. Um, and I ask about that because it's been really striking to me looking at the governmental features of Texas, the way in which um, there are these structural features that have to do with basically the absence of um, structures for consensus and for compromise mm -hmm. that seem to be in a lot of ways motivated by this yeah. kind of mythos of Texas. Like, we mm -hmm. don't need any higher bodies mm -hmm. above our kind of local council-like structures because we know how to do things already, maybe. And then also in addition to this, this whole talk about the Texas miracle, I don't know if you know, we're familiar with that, but that in particular has been used as um, a pretty harsh bludgeon against regulatory policy or regulatory um, structures. But I was reminded of institutional structures with a comment about labor parties mm -hmm. in the UK. So I'm wondering if um, you've noticed that maybe there's a significant correlation, you know, some off back of the envelope way, with um, people having fewer or less robust or less quality political structures or political institutions involved in their lives and pe the rise of these like identity movements or nationalist mm. movements Good. in addition with the economic factors. Mm. I'll just two, I'll just be very, very quick. Yes, you should write that about Texas. That sounds fascinating. And two, I would absolutely argue that the absence of um, effective democratic channels of representation at the European level is a huge part of the problem. So yes, I don't know, on the UK or other It's, it's interesting, in the European Parliament elections are always an interesting moment in British politics held every five years. and. Uh, the Brits would go off and sort of vote for politicians. They weren't quite sure where these politicians were going. I mean, right. if you look at all the survey data, the Brits have always been the most misinformed about Europe. It's something that, you know, we're very proud about. Um, <laughs> but they've, they, they just didn't know really what, what's going on in Brussels. They just kind of have to roll out and vote for these M MEPs. Uh, turnout was always, you know, desperately low. It was about 30% at these European Parliament elections. And when they did vote, they probably voted for populists and anti-EU um, uh, candidates just to sort of send a message to, to Brussels. Um, but the, 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 the broader point about institutional representation and, um, I mean, runs through the Brexit vote completely. I mean, if you just look at the, the work that I briefly mentioned on apathy and the way in which... What, what we what we call C1 and C2 workers, skilled, semi-skilled workers, parts of the lower middle class, basically withdrew from politics uh, back from 2001 onwards because they felt as though there, there was no effective uh, vehicle for representation. And the interesting stat for me is that of all those voters that didn't vote at the 2015 general election, but then turned out at the 2016 referendum, uh, six in ten voted for Brexit, right? That they uh, weren't participating under the normal rules of the electoral system, probably because they resided in safe seats that were held by Labour MPs that were pro-EU. They took the referendum context to register the vote for leave. And then they didn't vote at the 2017 general election, so they went back into apathy because they were back within the context of their safe seats where, to be frank, there was no point in them voting because they were often very large Labour majorities. And, and so that's where you begin to understand that when you, you, know, you change that, that broader context and actually the, 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 the dynamics are quite different, expressive voting comes much more into play. And, and obviously now Labour has kind of realised that. I mean, 140 Labour-held seats voted for Brexit and only 10 Labour MPs campaigned for Brexit. 45% of working-class Labour voters voted for Brexit compared to about 34% of middle-class Labour voters. So the Labour movement generally is sort of terrified of kind of the idea of having a, uh, 
kind of rerun of this exercise because it's directly cut across you know, its, its traditional constituencies and now faces the unenviable task of uniting working-class Doncaster with yeah. affluent um, wine bar Kensington. Right. Uh, and, and now the dilemma is how on earth you, you sustain that coalition for long enough to get Jeremy Corbyn into number 10. Yeah. That's right. It's an interesting uh, uh, exercise on uh, the importance of electoral systems. Mm. Yeah, right. oh, 100%. Mm. The, uh, in the, the, the uh, European elections is when the uh, UK gets to experience a proportional uh, yeah. representation. Um, so the Netherlands has the most proportional electoral system in the world, almost. Um, but that still uh, results in highly skewed uh, sort of parliaments vis-a-vis -vis the electorate, especially when it comes to European matters. As I said, the 80% um, of parliament, both houses of parliament, was in favor of the constitutional treaty, and it got rejected by more than 60% of the electorate. And this is an electoral system in which uh, there's no electoral threshold, uh, at least not a legal threshold. The only threshold that exists is mathematical. So there's 150 seats, one divided by 150, that's our threshold. So that's 0.6% of the vote. Um, but um, the fact of the matter is it's, these elections are run on, they're multidimensional. And part of the blame is on voters. Mm -hmm. They don't vote based on European matters in national elections. They vote on, um, on, on the economy or they vote on, uh, sometimes they vote on, on cultural issues. I mean, that's a recent phenomenon. Um, but EU sort of issue voting is hardly a thing. Yeah. So what ends up happening is that people vote for, for parties based on economic matters. And, you know, the, rep the representation in Parliament is completely pro-EU. I mean, there's a way to sort of to, uh, to uh, fix this, you know, uh, vote for your skeptic parties in the national parliament. You know? And in the Netherlands, again, it's highly proportional. They would get representation if they voted for your skeptic parties. But uh, your skepticism is mainly limited to either the radical left or the radical right. So voters have to compromise on other issues and are not willing to do it. So the, this multidimensional nature of, uh, of, of many European elections makes for... Uh, yeah, it, it, it creates this tension between what the parliamentary elites and the representatives want when it comes to Europe and what the electorate wants. And it comes to the fore in, in referenda. That's when it, because it really surfaces. Yeah, because it, it can. can, yeah. Well, I'm wondering, do you think that's because there aren't other um, political avenues for expressing that? I mean, I'm thinking, like, that, yeah. that would be the role of having other Present, be able to hash out those differences and maybe have some kind of mm -hmm. um, structure that promotes compromise. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can collect a couple of other questions and then together. Uh, go ahead and please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, my name is Stefan Davis. I'm uh, at Oxford University. Uh, I'm now visiting Harvard as well. So uh, I have a question about age. Because it feels like, um, I mean, we, we talked, uh, I guess, during the discussion, like a few of these kind of typical uh, determinants of voting were mentioned. As, and I guess these, these tend to be quite complicated, right? Like if it's related to a particular occupation or a particular sector, or maybe living in a particular region. But at least like these are all factors that people at least could, to a certain extent, influence themselves, which clearly holds, doesn't hold for age, right? It's like this very nice kind of simple <laughs> exogenous factor, if you want to call it that way. And it's quite re it's really fascinating. I find how like this 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 factor has been, like has started to become much more of a sorting mechanism, yeah. in particular for the Brexit vote. But I guess it also holds true, if I remember well, for for the election of Trump. And I'm just very curious to hear the panel's view on like why why old people are becoming so terrible. <laughs> well, okay, that's yeah, well, it's like one more and then you're back. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Chrissy Gavell. I'm a postdoc in the program in U.S.-Japan Relations, faculty at University of Hawaii. Um, so I actually work on Asian regionalism, mm -hmm. which is often thought to be somewhat reactionary in the early days as a response to NAFTA and the EU. So I was wondering, you know, a lot of the discussion has been internal, but are there external sources of sort of unity for Europe vis-a-vis, -vis, I don't know, Russia or the U.S. or Asia yeah. that, yeah. you know, haven't been discussed where you see some potential for, you know, cohesion around that, you know, perhaps to counteract some of these national movements? Mm. You would have thought 
that you know yeah. Russia might have united uh, Europe, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I feel like the opposite is the case. Huh. Uh, people are aligning in pro and anti-Russian camps in you know in various regions in Europe. Uh, it's well, terrifying in a way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's a little bit of evidence that Brexit united the rest of Europe. If you look at EU yeah. membership and support yeah. for EU membership, yeah. uh, that's when everybody got quite excited about Macron's election and they said populism was over. Do you remember that period, that sort of brief well, two-week <laughs> window? It started with the Austrian Green president. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. That was, I mean, that was, that yeah. was But that actually leads to the amazing. interesting... Uh, the, um, um, the, the other interesting question about age, because this is, you know, the big popular idea, right? That it's the angry old white man, and this is a kind of uh, awkward period in the history of liberal representative democracy. That once those, once those guys just die off, everything becomes, you know, a little bit easier. And I say that because it's it's an argument that is wheeled out weekly in the British press, right? But the Economist loves that argument, right? Um, but it, I mean, the evidence is just, you know just not there. Um, the average age of Brexit, Brexit voters was 52, um, which I don't consider to be uh, old. Um, Marine Le Pen, Austrian Freedom Party, strongest among the under 40s without degrees. The generational replacement argument, I, I just really do not believe stands up to scrutiny. Even you know, James Tilley at Oxford has shown as each year goes by, there's a 0.3 percent increase in the uh, in support for right-wing parties in in Britain that the life cycle effect is is still stronger than period effects um, and I think we just conveniently ignore a lot of that um, there are examples that you could point to you could point to the UKIP electorate and say typically over 60s but you can look at the AFD electorate in Germany and say well strongest among 30 to 55 year olds or you could look at law and justice in Poland. One of the most successful populist nationalist movements in Europe has a relatively um, kind of evenly distributed um, demographic. And I think, you know, if, you, if we buy into that notion as well, what we, what we miss out is the, the potential for that narrative, that argument to actually mobilize the other uh, groups in society. I think Trump uses this quite effectively. I think the Leave campaign uses this quite effectively at framing these elections as the last chance for groups that feel their position in society is under threat. And you just look at the turnout, um, the data on turnout, white working class turnout at the 2016 referendum was much higher than the pollsters anticipated. About two and a half million white working class voters turned out that, that basically we were told wouldn't turn out. Most of those voted for Brexit. Trump, you know, you can see quite a strong turnout among white working class non-college uh, uh, degree holders. Whereas the kind of key elements of that new um, kind of America ascendant coalition that, that Stan Greenberg and others talked about, the kind of ethnically, religiously, culturally diverse millennial students, both at the Brexit referendum and with the Trump election, didn't turn out at the levels that we were told they would turn out at. I mean, if you looked at young millennials in Britain, turnout in some of the key areas, university towns and London was down. And they only began to rectify that in June of the 2017 election, but they were still 30 points, their turnout was 30 points lower than the over 70s, right? Um, so we're not sort of seeing that argument, I think, play out anywhere near the extent to which Jan Angan Esch and Jeremy Cliff would, would have us believe it's taking place. I think it's also important to look at uh, the vast differences within these generations. The people that um, usually invoke these generational uh, Stories they refer to urban uh, young you know, college graduates um, and um, the uh, the group that you never hear about are the uh, you know the middle and lower educated uh, young people that are completely apathetic towards uh, towards politics or towards uh, you know um, what what is interesting in the Netherlands is both left wing populism and right wing populism has begun to uh, show shades of, um, um, it, 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 the, the camps have become divided. So on both the left and the right, you have this sort of folksy party, uh, Geert Wilders, 
And on the left, you have the Socialist Party. They have this folksy element. They're very popular in rural regions, etc. And on the right and on the left, you have the Animal Rights Party and the New Forum for Democracy, who are extremely popular in urban regions among, um, um, among white, young, predominantly male voters. And it seems like, uh, yeah, within the generations, there's often so much sort of variance that I, I feel like um, often it gets, uh, gets ignored when people talk about uh, the, uh, this generational divide. I mean, it's just huge differences between uh, young people based on their social milieus and based on their education that I think uh, is also politically relevant. Just really quickly, um, so I'm, I'm curious, Matthew, so the, all the graphs that I saw about like, you know, 75% of those under 25 voted remain, and it, then it's like this step graph where it sort of tails off depending on how, how much older than you are. Did that all sort of not prove to be correct? Because you said the average age, but I was seeing stuff about how it really was the younger folks that were voting stay. Remain. Well, on, on, so the average age of a Remainer was 44. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, they were more likely to vote okay. Remain, but they were not as likely as uh, leavers to turn out and actually right. vote. Right, um, right. About one in four right. young right. graduates right. voted for Brexit. Right. Um, one in three black and ethnic minority voters right. voted for okay. Brexit. So we need to sort of sort through what was Well, your really point about on. nuance yeah. and variation, right, right, I think it's right. spot on. I mean, because right. definitely there is an easy jet generation in the EU. So I grew up in Europe and we had to take trains everywhere because, you know, airplanes were so incredibly expensive and you didn't like, you know, I mean, the European space has been so fundamentally transformed in terms of sort of mobility for certain types of younger folks, I think. And I think that has to impact the way they think about the EU as a threat or as something that actually is enabling them to, you know, live the lives that they want to live. I mean, there's just no doubt in my mind that that is a cleavage. There clearly is, you know, I feel like that that is an important cleavage. I think we don't understand it adequately. So I have talked to folks in the European Commission President's office and so on who actually think that Brexit and Russia and Trump have created this great opportunity for them to drive forward, particularly with uh, security and defense policy. And they actually have been moving quite significantly towards much more sort of majority, majority decision making around uh, security and defense issues. And they feel like, you know, the wind is actually in their sails, right? I would argue that they're doing it in ways that actually are not uh, going to create the kind of political support they need, that they're, again, doing it in this very sort of technocratic and hidden way, and that, yes, they need, do need to talk about a European army, right? The interesting thing about watching Farage, because I was writing this book about symbols and practices, is, like, he would stand up in the European Parliament and rail about the Ryder Cup, like, when other people were like, who cares about the Ryder Cup, right? So the Ryder Cup has U.S. versus EU, right? And he would find that incredibly annoying. And I'd be like, yeah, it is annoying, right? Because these are, you know, taking on these kind of symbols and practices that we associate with nation states, right? Um, and he was like one of the few people to kind of find this really annoying, right? Um, and I think it is, it is consequential. And I think, but I think that if the EU wants to move forward, and actually the polling data shows that that is one of the areas where there's the most support amongst the EU publics, right? It's in sort of external foreign policy, common, common defense, all that kind of stuff. But they, they cannot just sort of, you know, make it banal. They have to actually kind of create some political, political support for it and call it what it is. But that's just me. A few more questions. Thank you. I don't expect necessarily an answer to this, but one of your slides, Kate, made me think of some 19th century popularism. Mm. Uh, and then we have to study history lists that have a lesson, yeah. but I don't think there's any lesson in it necessarily. Uh, the Irish rebels, rebels would burn the British pound notes mm. of the individual bankers wherever they could nice. find them. Yeah. And the response of the bankers was to laugh with great pleasure because mm. the burning of the note meant that the debt was extinguished. There was no evidence of debt that that note represented oh, from, wow. from these private wow. banks. That's right. Uh, but to seeing that guy holding yeah. up uh, yeah. the euro the with euro. such joy of burning yeah. it, do they burn their own yeah. fingers? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Mays, I'm, I'm also a tourist here visiting from uh, Malaysia. Um, I, I, I wondered if you agree with the observation that perhaps counterintuitively, uh, a lot of the populist parties, especially on the right, are actually uh, 
presenting, uh, um, you know, a, a narrative of a pretty cohesive European identity that needs to be protected against, you know, the barbarians at the gate, uh, whether oh, those okay. be uh, Syrian refugees yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, they talk about the, the enemy within. Um, and, and in doing so, um, yeah. you know, we tend to think of these as nationalists, but right. but there's there's a big sort of appeal to a common heritage, uh, that of the Enlightenment, um, that of shared Christian Judeo, which is mm -hmm. a wonderful, interesting combination as if that was, uh, you know, a, a peaceful coexistence uh, throughout European history, right? And so, so if you, I wonder if you agree with the with, with this observation that this is something that those parties do, and yeah. and if so, if Mm -hmm. uh, if this is a successful formula that the technocratic elites yeah. can actually build on in creating that shared identity. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we, we have a third question? I think that's a very good question. I'm going to steal your thunder just first one minute. Um, I think it taps into another bigger question, which is, you know, maybe this might be the last round of questions. I don't know. So I'd, I'd be slightly provocative and say, you know, where's the EU going? Um, and what are the challenges to it? Uh, and that speaks directly to that because what your, you know, the big, the big success story for Euroscepticism, in my opinion, uh, was that it merged with uh, public opposition to immigration, yeah. and that sense of ethnic threat we now know from various studies is a significant predictor of also being hostile to the EU. So by making that pitch for the populist right parties, you know, by saying this is about defending Europe from you know, the barbarian hordes or, you know, the, the, the culturally distinct groups outside of the continent, you know, they are really doubling down on that. But I would suggest they're also opening up a kind of second flank, which is linking Euroscepticism yeah. with, the, with security right. and with the idea of security for the native uh, group. Uh, and that is, is allowing several of these parties, you know, beginning in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. to make the case that actually the opposition is not, is not actually anti-liberal opposition, it's very much pro-liberal opposition in terms of defending women's rights or defending the rights mm -hmm. of same-sex couples, right. etc., right. right. which in turn is opening up those parties to parts of, say, the middle class, uh, a broad, you know, giving them a broader reach within electorates than they had in the 80s. If you go back to Jean-Marie Le Pen's campaigns in 84, 85, they were incredibly crude. Two million unemployed, two million immigrants, right? You just mm -hmm. don't really see mm -hmm. those types of campaigns today. They're a bit more subtle and they'll latch onto this idea that they're defending liberal traditions. Yeah, and so I think that the refugee yeah, crisis yeah. has really fueled that. Ivan Krastev's book, After Europe, really makes this case quite forcefully that the big challenge for the EU now is actually trying to promote this sense of collective identity and solidarity right. in an era where right. the refugee exactly. crisis has really galvanized yeah. people's concerns over that threat, not just to ethnic identity, but a basic sense of threat to security. Right. Very difficult to know how the EU right. Right. can respond to that. So I was actually going to ask you all to reflect on the implications of your talks for where Europe is going. Oh my goodness. That's great that you kicked us oh out in that direction. I think you're going to I, um, I mean, the thing with uh, Brexit, when it happened, and even prior to it happening, you know, polls showing that it might happen, I think the, um, what it created was this sort of sense of, um, you know, is it possible to leave the EU? Is it possible to be a ex-EU member and uh, be, uh, you know, have a sustainable economy and everything? Um, and for some reason, I think... That, that, that right after the Brexit vote happened, I think that many of these exit skeptics in other, especially Western Northern European countries were emboldened. Yeah. They thought, uh, you know, they didn't see any economic collapse or, or, or right. that sort of stuff. And, uh, but, but then, um, you know, now given how the Tories are botching the entire thing, yeah. you know, they're, emboldened again because you know it's not because of brexit that you know it's the uk Johnson. is it's, yeah. uh, it's it's because the tories aren't doing a good job right so there um and and so i think the the possibility of uh, of of yeah. the uk leaving and actually having left well 
uh, at least on paper. They're trying to leave now. Um, uh, it, it creates, uh, it creates, um, so it, it's, it's feasible that other countries will leave too. Now, having said that, in the Netherlands, uh, which is one of the countries where exit skepticism is most popular, it's still not a majority of the population by far. It's a sizable group, um, but um, you know, as of yet, there's no reason to, to believe that, that that will happen. Can I push you on that very briefly? Um, I know we're yeah. running out of time. But if most surveys we know that we use day in, day out are not capturing right. the non-voters that are now turning up to yep. the election contest over the last mm. two years. Now, if I looked at the BSA before Brexit and we'd had this seminar before Brexit, I'd be here saying nowhere near a majority backs leaving mm. the European Union, mm. right? So we, we've got some fundamental problems with, no, yeah. with no. our surveys too. Yeah, so I was going to say, um, you know, the polls, uh, the polls at this moment don't give any reason to believe that the Netherlands would ever leave the EU but uh, we all know what happened to polls. Um, so, yeah, I think um, uh, I think in the end, the uh, the, the European um, um, the, the European establishment uh, just simply has to get used to the idea that there's always going to be a sizable chunk that yeah, resists I European agree. integration. It's not something that has to be solved. It's a natural state of affairs, and and the solution is extremely, you know, it, it requires it requires a lot of sort of. Yeah. Some regions require this, other regions right. require right. that, other regions, right. and you know, but but you know, this very simple yeah. notion right. doesn't seem to, <laughs> to you know, have any traction in Brussels. Yeah, yeah. no, I think that's right. Uh, uh, very briefly, I don't think the EU is going anywhere. Uh, although, what's funny is, you know, if you look at sort of the EU websites, it's already now 27. Right. So Britain is already out of like a lot of the maps, a lot of the kind of graphics. It's fascinating, right? Even though who knows what's really going to happen. Um, but I don't think the EU is going anywhere. I think it's so, so, you know, it's like um, it's going to be so difficult and consequential to get out of the EU, just even on the sort of the trade treaty side and all of that stuff, that it's going to be such a mess that I think that it's going to put the brakes on other exit movements. Um, but that is, could all be thrown in the air if, in fact, we see more referenda, which I think are, of course, a terrible mechanism of democracy. So, and I get attacked for saying things like that because I'm an elitist. But I think there's no way that such a complex question as a belonging to the EU or not is suitable for that. What I'd rather see is overt contestation and electoral contestation around the substance of the EU through political parties, domestically and at the EU level. Can okay, I, one more. Well, just <laughs> I yeah you yeah well just the referendum thing. <laughs> um, well, I sometimes I wish that we had a referendum on the euro. On the you know? euro, sure. What well, would have happened? What's the worst thing that could have happened? Had we had a, euro, uh, a referendum on the euro in all sorts of member yeah, states, no, maybe it would have been idea. rejected. Not a good idea. Um, maybe uh, it would have led to, as you see in other referenda, when it gets, when you know, when the constitutional treaty got rejected, it went through anyway with mm -hmm. minor revisions. Maybe the result would have been sort of a discussion about whether or not it was a good idea yeah. to harmonize no, that's true. all these. That's true. Yeah. You know, economies, etc. Um, right. uh, from sure. above. Sure. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I tend to be less skeptical about some of these referendums. All right. Well, on that note. <laughs> <laughs>